Hey there, Bri here. Today we're talking about writing safety policies for ease of use. These are great reference documents that should not be collecting dust on your shelf. So stick around and today I actually have a free download for you to help you write your policies. And we're going to talk about the two sections that every policy should have. Let's get to it. Hello, 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 and welcome to The Safety Geek. My name is Bri, your number one safety geek. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Today, we are talking about safety policies. Now, these are different from SOPs and from, J and from JHAs. SOPs and JHAs tell you how to do the job. Safety policies tell you why they are in place. And a lot of times what I see in businesses is the policies end up sitting on a shelf, collecting dust. Very rarely are they ever referenced because everybody is paying attention to the how. So they're not being fully utilized. And I think part of that reason is they end up being complicated. I mean, pull out one of your safety policies. How many pages is it? How wordy is it, right? So that's what we're going to talk about today is how to create policies that are easy to be a reference document for your entire management team. So before we get started, I do have a free download that goes with this video and this episode, and you can get that at thesafetygeek.com forward slash 43. All right, so first off, how you should be using your safety policies. Now, a lot of times you have your safety policies in place because a regulation requires it, but more often than not, you have them in place just to kind of set the ground rules, right? That you want people to follow certain things and you want certain things in place. It's not necessarily good enough for an SOP because it's not telling you how you do the job, but it's like, hey, our ultimate goal is to protect everybody from the chemicals in the workplace or from the electrical hazards or whatever it has to be. So it kind of just sets the foundation for your SOPs and your JHAs. Now how they should be used is that every time that you have a change in process or every time you're in an accident investigation, you should be pulling out the related policies and reading them because that's where you can find places that the company can actually either make changes based on the accident investigation or to make sure that they're touching all their bases if they're having a change in process or a change in equipment or anything like that. So these should not be collecting dust on the shelf. They are living documents. Granted, we only update them maybe every year or every two years or whenever there is a change in process, but you definitely want them to be a collection of policies and, and, and documents that are referenced on a regular basis. All right, so to make your policies easy to read, you don't want them to be full of a bunch of regulation jargon. So what I see a lot of people do is they basically copy and paste the regulation into their policy, which that doesn't make any sense because you can just put the regulation book right next to the policy. And you can put in your policy this is to comply with regulation 1910-126. And that way you can go right to the regulation book and read the regulation. There's no reason to combine the two or to copy the regulation jargon and put it into your policy. You want your policy to be understood and be able to be read by your workers, by your management team, and you want it to be easy. So put everything in layman's terms. Don't put those fancy words in there that people aren't going to understand. Make sure you're using really common sense language. And there's no requirement saying that you have to copy the regulations in there. I've had that question too. But here's the thing. A lot of people, when they're creating their safety policies, they go get a policy template, maybe from their insurance company, from their third party auditor, maybe they purchase one on, online. And those templates are full of regulation jargon. And they have to do that, right? Because the company that you're buying it from, they're kind of protecting themselves to make sure that they have all of their liability bases covered. 
Um, and then on top of it, they're trying to cover a very wide range of industries and companies. So they include a lot in there. There's nothing wrong with using these templates. Just make sure that you take a step back and that you're reading them thoroughly and that you are making them more site specific. Too many times people go into these canned programs and they just change the company name to theirs and say, boom, I got a policy. You know, it's, yeah, you may have a policy, it may get you a check mark, but when an inspector comes in and they see that it is a canned program that you have not made the effort to make site specific, they're going to throw it out as being an ineffective policy. So you have to make sure that you've actually gone through the effort of reading it, taking out what doesn't apply, and putting in what does apply. Because it is more important that your team can understand the policy than it is for it to be looking all fancy and including every little bit and bob that you could possibly put in it. Your policy is there to kind of set the standard and the foundation for the rules. It's not to just spout out that you know your safety stuff, okay? So consider that as well, that you really wanna make sure that your policies are understood by your people. So one example I would use is that if there is specific terms that have to be used within the policy, like for lockout tagout, it's really important that the people using the policy understand the difference between an affected employee and an authorized employee. So I wouldn't change those terms. But when you're talking about like an exit route, most people understand exits as exits, not egress. So the word egress is not common language for most people. You want your policies to be written it like anywhere from a fifth to an eighth grade language, and they won't understand that term. And changing it from egress to exit is not going to be that difficult, and it doesn't eliminate anything from the policy. So things like that, when you're looking at those co more complicated safety terms, if it really doesn't need to be used, then don't use it. Just put in the layman's terms instead. And don't write it like it's an owner's manual either. You know, you, you want to keep your sentences short. You want to keep, you want it to be technical. You want to make sure that you are getting in all of the details of the policy. So like if I was writing a HASCOM policy, I would have, you know, a section on labels, a section on SDSs, a section on cleaning up spills, a section on identifying hazards, right? But I can keep each section short and to the point and then just reference the regulation if I needed to. Because all the little details on how you do the job and how you uh, clean up a spill, that's gonna be in your SOPs anyway. So the policy is really just to set that foundation and to state why. So what I like to use is the KISS method. Now we've all heard about the KISS method, that is keep it simple, stupid, right? But um, you just really wanna keep your policy writing as simple as possible. So I have some tips for you on how you can keep your writing simple. So first off, just write your policy the way you feel like it should be written. Include everything that you want to include in there. If you're using a template, then use the template. You know, you might end up with a 15-page policy. That's perfectly fine. Just start off with a policy written the way that you want. Next, you're going to go through it, and you're going to try to remove any adverbs and adjectives. These are the words that usually end with L-E, or they're describing something. They don't add to the description. All they do is add fluff to your policy, and it actually makes them less clear. So try to use adverbs spare. <laughs> try to use adverbs sparingly. Do you see what I did there? <laughs> I used an adverb. <laughs> so anyway, just make sure that you use them sparingly. Make sure that you are using adjectives only when appropriate. That's going to cut down a lot of your writing. And then look at any complicated words and see if you can define them more clearly, like the egress versus exit. And if you can't, then you're gonna mark that word as a definition at the end of the policy. So affected employees, authorized employees, those would be words that I would definitely put in a, def in a definition section. So I'm using them within the policy, but if they don't know what it is, they can go down to definitions and they can get a clear answer as to what an affected employee is versus what an authorized employee is, right? So no any terms for definition section. Next, you're gonna read it again. And your goal is to cut it by 30%. 
It is time to prune, my friend. Get rid of all of the fluff. So what I want you to think of when we think about pruning is if you actually cut back, let's say you have a big rose bush, and if you actually cut it back and keep it small, it actually grows healthier and thicker and stronger. Same thing with your policy. Same thing with your writing. So make sure that you, you're looking through it and going, does this really need to be there? Do I need five sentences to get my point across or can I bring it down to two sentences or three sentences? So make sure that you are simplifying your policy by cutting out the extra verbiage. 30%, that is the goal. So if I have a 15 page policy, I wanna get it down to 10 pages. Ultimately, your policy should be as few pages as possible. Um, much more than about five pages, your people are not going to read it thoroughly and it's not gonna become a useful document. So ideally you wanna get it down to five pages, but that is tough for some policies. All right, and then the last, once you have it pruned down to as low as you think you can get it, I want you to hand it off to one of your employees that works within the policy and say, please read this and tell me if it's understandable. So that way you're getting that last double check and you're making sure that you are writing it in layman's terms. You might then wanna say, highlight any words that you don't understand as you're reading it. So that way you know which ones you need to define at the end. And that is how you actually prune that policy and get it down to make it even easier to read. Now, neatness does count when it comes to safety. So I highly suggest that you keep your policies standardized, that you use the same format. So let's say that you're using those templates, right? Maybe you got a template from here, a template from here, you downloaded one off the internet, right? That's all fine and good. Put them all into a standardized format, the same font, the same size, the same colors, the same headings, all of that, make them very standardized. Put your sections in the same order, which is what the free download is for today's episode. It is called the Safety Policy Elements Checklist. And this will give you all the different sections that you should have in every single one of your policies. And you put them in the same order for every policy. So for those of you that have been around for a while, if you remember MSDSs years and years ago, you would go to one MSDS and it was like in one order. Like I, I used to have to hunt and pack to find the first aid information. And then I go over to this one and it was somewhere else. And then I go to this MSDS and it was somewhere else. So one of the things when they updated the uh, hazard communication policy was that they standardized the SDSs where they all had to have the same sections in the same order. So we all know which section is first aid, which section is fire prevention, which section is reactive, right? That's how you want your policies to be. So that no matter what policy you are reading, you know exactly what section to go to to find your information on training, to find your information on record keeping, to find it on who the policy applies for. So always keep them in the same order and definitely get the download. It's at thesafetygeek.com forward slash 43. So that way you can get your checklist of all the different sections in the policy. Now I will tell you, my checklist is extremely thorough. I have several sections that some people don't include in their policy. And these are um, two things that I have picked up actually from OSHA inspectors. Because if you remember, I'm a big VPP person. I helped a lot of companies get to VPP. I'm really a good advocate for v VPP. And when I was an SGE, I learned that there were these two policies that this one OSHA inspector was like, you know, people never include these and it would be a really good idea. So I always make sure that I include those two in my, policy, in my policies. And from that point forward, whenever I had an auditor or an inspector or anybody look at my policies, they're just like, wow, your policies are so thorough. So all of my sections are there for you so that way you can copy them. I'm not gonna tell you what those two are. So you have to kind of guess what they are. They're not the two most important, but they are definitely critical to thinking about hazards that don't normally come along. All right, so before we end, I promised you that I would tell you the two most important sections of your safety policy for ease of use. And that is the policy statement and summary. So at the very beginning of your policy, you wanna put a statement that says, this is what this policy is about, and this is a summary of the policy. So if I'm thinking about HASCOM, I might say something like, this policy is to comply with this regulation, and in this policy, we make sure that we're communicating the hazards with employees, that, that we are you know, maintaining our chemicals to minimize uh, hazards and 
all of that good stuff. It's generally about four or five sentences long. It's not a big section. The idea of this section is that when someone first opens up your policy, then they know if they are in the right place just by reading that. Now, hazard communication for us is just a common knowledge policy, right? But for a worker, they might not understand what hazard communication means. So for them, they can open it right away and see, oh, this is about chemicals, <laughs> you know? And it gives them the reference to the uh, regulation as well. I always include the reference to regulation in the, in the policy statement. I also include it in the very bottom in the reference section as well. And then my... Um, Regulation book is always right there by my policies, so since they have the reference number, they can actually go look at the regulation at the same time. So the, uh, the second section that is so important that you should have right in the beginning of your policy is the scope. The scope is who the policy applies to, and this could be specific job titles, it could be departments, it could be areas, it could be tasks. It doesn't matter. There is nothing worse than reading through a 10-page policy to find out in the very end that it doesn't even apply to you. So you want to have that right in the beginning. This policy only applies when you're working in this area. Or this policy applies to everyone, and it even extends to contractors. You know, whatever it happens to be, you want to have the scope right there in the beginning. And speaking of order, so those are our two most important sections, and those are in the beginning of your safety policy. But speaking of order, I kind of like to think of policies as like a sandwich. You have the beginning section of your policy that has all of this just like general summarized information. You end up having your policy statement, your summary, your scope, your responsibilities, all of that good stuff that's like laying it out right in the beginning. And then in the middle, you have the meat of your policy, right? These are the actual policy details. This is how we're handling labels, how we're handling SDSs, you know, what our policy is about new chemicals coming onto site, whatever it happens to be. That's the meat. That's the big portion of your policy. And then at the end of your policy, you have all the little extras. This could be how you do your record keeping, who you go to for questions, any legal disclaimers that you want to add in there. Um, your definitions and your references. Too many times people put definitions and references in the very beginning of the policy. People's attention cannot handle that. You have to have definitions at the end of the policy. So think about when you're reading a book and they have like indices and appendices. They're always at the end. That's what your references and your definitions are. And your references are things like what regulations you're referencing. It could be ANSI, it could be NFPA, it could be OSHA. All, anything that's related to that policy you can put in your reference section and then your definitions or any of those words that are not common language that are found within your policy you want to define in the end as well so you have your beginning which is like starting them up am I in the right place you have the meat of the policy and then you have all those little extras all the all the little footnotes on little um, credits at the end of the policy go there so that's kind of how I see how you should create your policies and then make sure that you're always putting them in the same format, standardized. If you use a binder system, all your binders should match. And keep them in a place where people have access to them. Too many times we have them locked up behind our desk or we have them in a shared drive that employees really don't have access to. The best process I've ever seen for policy management was a bookshelf outside the safety manager's office with all the policy binders sitting there that anybody could access at any time and just grab them and read them if they need to. And that's how it should be. You wanna have transparency, you wanna have communication with your employees. All right, my safety friend, that is what I have for you this week. I challenge you to take one of your policies and put it through the KISS method. Try to knock out 30%. Count how many adverbs you have in there. I make you bet you have a ton. And try to reduce it down and make that policy simple to read and simple to use. And don't forget to download the free checklist that goes with this episode, which is at thesafetygeek.com forward slash 43. I will chat with you next week, and in the meantime, have a safe week. Bye for now.